we've all heard people talk about the good life, right? It seems like the older people get, the more they talk about it, right? Because they're thinking about retirement and what will the, the glorious retirement look like. Maybe you have talked about it here in this room, even though you might not be super close to that time. Maybe you've thought about it. I know I've thought about it. But what do people mean when they talk about the good life? For some people, they're talking about fun, talking about financial security, having exciting weekends, going to ball games, going to concerts, having money, enough money to go out and eat out all the time, you know, so you don't have to cook at home and wash dishes. For other people, they might think that the good life is more about family time, right? Getting together as a family, being together as much as possible. Others, the good life is traveling, right? traveling, seeing the sights in this country, and maybe going to other places in the world, seeing the amazing sights and uh, the, the food and the people and, and just making those travel memories. Maybe part of that is getting a really nice vehicle you can drive around in or a really nice boat uh, or an RV. And then for others, the good life might just be about relaxation. You know, just get me a nice rocking chair on the front porch and I am, I am set. I am perfect, right? Taking it easy. Now, for those of us here today who are looking for the good life, uh, or if you're maybe not here today, but you're listening to this message, and you are also looking for the good life, I have a suggestion for you. And my suggestion is simply that you look at this passage with me here today. Because if we look at this passage here today, you can hear straight from the mouth of Jesus what the good life actually looks like. So as we look at this passage today, again, we earlier, just a few moments ago, we saw verses 1 all the way down through verse 11. This morning we're going to vo- focus in specifically on verses 7 through 11. And we're going to see three things that describe what I believe to be the good life according to God's will. Whenever you think of the good life, one of the things often comes to mind. You want to be able to have amazing experiences, right? Even if you're not retired or not even close to that, you still, you want to have an exciting life, right? You want to have some amazing experiences. And we see that here. That's actually part of God's will. But maybe not the same way that we have been thinking. So if you look with me now at verses 7 through 8, we'll see here that Jesus wants us to do amazing things through him. Verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus wants us to do amazing things through him. Now, when we look at this passage, you look at verse 7, um, and the verses before verse 7, what has Jesus been talking about here? One word, starts with an A. He's been talking about abiding. He's been talking about abiding in him, and he abiding in us, and his words abiding in us, and so on and so forth. So abiding, what does that mean? We don't, we don't really use the word abide every day, at least I don't. Um, It simply means to live in. It means to remain in. So abiding in Christ means that we are always connected to Christ and we are always getting our life from Christ. There are two ways to look at that. And both of those two ways are present in this passage here today. The first way is, if you are a Christian, you abide in Christ positionally. When you made that decision to turn from death unto life, you then were placed in Christ. You're abiding in Christ. You get your life from Christ because that of that time when you turned from darkness to light, when you turned from death to life, when you accepted Christ to be your Savior. You're abiding in Christ. That's one way that we see in this passage uh, that Christ refers, refers to as abiding in him. But there's another way, and this other way is the way that I believe this passage is talking about even more. And that is the day-to-day abiding in Christ. 
So the first way is positionally. We're positionally abiding in Christ. We're there. But the second way I would refer to is practically. Practically abiding in Christ. Practically living in Christ. Practically, day to day, getting our life, our energy from Christ. That is the harder one. That is the one that I believe this passage is really focusing on here today. And so as Christ talks about this, beginning in verse 1 and continuing down into our passage for today, we see more of what he's talking about and what it means to abide in Christ. So we see here that in verse 7, for those who are abiding in Christ and who have Christ's words abiding in them, Jesus gives them a stunning promise, an amazing promise, an incredible promise. A promise that's too good to be true, you feel like, when you read about it. And here is, again, part of that amazing uh, good life, seeing him do amazing things. So what does he say again in verse 7? We just read it, but let's look at it again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask, what does he say? Whatever you wish. And it might be done for you. Is that what he says? No, he says, it will be be done for you. Now already our minds start turning, right? Really? Whatever I wish? We might think of uh, the, 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 uh, the Disney movie Aladdin, right? And the, uh, the genie, you know, basically. So, so all I have to do is, is rub that lamp and I get whatever I want. Is that what Jesus is talking about here? Now, first of all, I'd like to, I'd like, before we get to the bottom of this, I first of all like to mention that when he says, ask whatever you wish, it's kind of like a command. It's not just like, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if you feel like it, ask whatever you want. Now he's saying, if you are abiding in me, if, if day to day you are getting your life from me, and my words, my word is in you, in your mind and in your heart, guess what? I want you to ask whatever you wish. He's not just inviting us. He's not just saying, you can if you want to. He's saying, if you are walking with me, I want you to ask me. I want you to ask me for things, and I will give them to you. We don't always think about God that way, right? Because if we're honest, we have asked God for things time and time and time and time and time again, almost to infinity, we feel like. Maybe there are certain prayer requests that you have been praying about, not just for days, but for years. And guess what? You don't feel that God has answered that prayer request, or God has not uh, answered it the way that you have asked him. So when we look at a passage like this, we are, we are skeptical, aren't we? We are skeptical, we are doubtful, and we don't really um, feel that God is being straightforward with us here. But, again, he says, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you, for you. So this is a theme, though, as we continue to get to the bottom of this. I want to say first, uh, next that this is a theme that Jesus has talked about just in the previous chapter. If you've got your Bibles op open to John 15, you might just need to flip the page to chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. So chapter 14, verse 12, here Jesus, Jesus has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is... Uh, he said that in verse 6, very well-known passage. But jumping down to verse 12, we have one of his truly, truly statements. Now remember, whenever Jesus says, truly, truly, he really, really means what, he, what he's saying. And he means everything he says, but here he really wants us to know that he really means it. And he wants us to pay attention to it. Truly, truly, I say to you, <clears throat> whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then verse 14, it's as if Jesus really wants us to understand this. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So, Jesus has repeated himself in chapter 14. Come to chapter 15, he is repeating himself again. 
And he says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So, again, this isn't something that Jesus is kind of just slipping under the rug or just hoping that we sort of get, but, you know, maybe not. You know, this is something Jesus is emphasizing here. I will also say this is very similar to another passage of Scripture that I would say is very well known to many of us. Psalm 37, verse 4, which says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will do what? Give you the desires of your heart. All right, so delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. So passage in the Old Testament here that's very similar to what we're seeing here in the book of John. So, putting this together, what does it mean? Does it mean that any prayer request that we have, not, no matter whether it's for a brand new house, no matter whether it's for a million dollars, no matter whether it's for a perfect body, whatever is important to you, that Jesus will make it happen? Is that what this passage is saying? Well, when Jesus makes this promise, he assumes that there's something in place in our hearts first. All right, And he's talked about this already. And it's harder for us to grasp this, but he's assuming that there's something in place first. He assumes that these prayer requests that we offer, where he says, ask whatever you want and it'll be done for you, he's assuming something. That these prayer requests are going to come from a specific mo- uh, a specific type of heart, a specific mindset in our lives. He is assuming that, though, that, that these prayer requests come from a believer who is truly abiding in Christ, whose thoughts and desires are so closely in tune with Christ and Christ's mission that we basically understand what God's will is for us in that moment. Now, I'm not saying that we would be 100% all the time because, right, we're, we're still sinful. We're still going to be sinful till the day we are glorified, till the day that we leave this earth um, in, in death or till Christ returns. You know, we're still going to struggle with sin. But what Christ is saying here is that if we are walking with him to that degree of closeness, we're going to have that sense of what his will is. And we're going to know when we have that desire to ask for something, but we know, wait, I already know this isn't God's will. So I'm not even going to ask for it. All right, that is what Jesus is talking about. And you say, well, I don't know, Pastor Wade, I don't know that you're quite on, on the mark there with that. Well, let's consider one other passage. The book of James has a lot of great things to say. Um, James Chapter 4, verse 3, though, is, has the truth that I think really helps us understand this as well. What, is, what does James say in chapter 4, verse 3? Feel free to turn there if you'd like, because this really helps us understand John chapter 14 and 15. James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Or as the King James says, you ask amiss. And what does it mean to ask wrongly or to ask amiss? To spend it on your passions. To spend it on your lusts. So here we have the reason why oftentimes God does not answer our prayers. Because we're asking selfishly. We're asking wrongly. We're asking amiss. We're asking according to our own lusts and passions. James continues in that passage passage in verses 4 through 10. What does he say in verses 4 through 10? He says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself what? An enemy of God. Or do you suppose it to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God. 
and then he will draw near to you. What we're seeing in this passage, that closest to God, that abiding in Christ. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Wash your hands of this sinfulness. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded again, you want to hang on to the world, but you know Christ is also the truth, but you are not in your life day-to-day committing to Christ. You're double-minded. Be wretched. Mourn and weep. Sorrow for your sin, for your double-mindedness. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, there's this theology out there that says, you shouldn't be sad. You shouldn't, you know, be sorrowful in your Christian life. You should always be happy. You should always be joyful. You should always be satisfied. Well, according to this passage, if you are caught up in some sin, you need to sorrow for that sin. You need to mourn for that sin. You need to feel bad over that sin. You need to suffer a little bit. You need to recognize that that is sin in your life that needs to be cast away. So sorrow is a, is a very clear part of the Christian life for someone who recognizes that there is sin in their lives. But, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So why do I bring up James chapter 4? Because it helps us understand what we read here in James chapter, sorry, John chapter 15 about Christ giving us whatever we ask for. The reason why we often do not receive what we ask for is because we are much like the people that J- James is talking about in James chapter 4. We are adulterous people. We are friends of the world. We unfortunately act like enemies of God many times. We are not humble. We are not submissive to his will. We want to consume things upon our own lusts. We need to cleanse our hands and our hearts because we are double-minded. We need to humble ourselves before God before he will exalt us, and then we are in that spot of abiding in Christ day to day, and we are in that place of seeing him answer those prayers because we're no longer asking for things according to our own lusts. We're asking for things according to his own will. So I believe that helps us understand what Jesus is talking about here in in John chapter 15 and John chapter 14. Someone who abides in Christ does what? Psalm 37, delights in the Lord. Someone who recognizes his spiritual adultery and friendship with the world, James chapter 4. Someone who submits himself to God, resists Satan's temptations, draws near to God, repents of sin, sorrows over sin, humbles himself before God. That is the person who is abiding in Christ. That is the person who will experience the promise of answered prayer. That's the promise for someone who is abiding. That's what it means to abide in Christ, that we are continually examining our lives, we are repenting, we are humbling ourselves, we are growing day to day, we are getting our life from Christ. Not our life from our jobs, not our life from our families, not our life from our TV shows, or video games, or whatever it is that we enjoy doing. We're getting our life from Christ. Now, does that mean we can never um, partake in some of these things? Absolutely not. God has given us family. God has given us food. God has given us times of relaxation. But if those are the things that drive us, that's the problem. We are, we, we have given in to our own lusts too much, and we have pushed Jesus back into the background of our Christian lives. And so we're not seeing him do the work that we would like him to, to, to see, we would like to see him do. We see that Jesus follows this stunning promise with a challenge that also helps understand the promise of answer prayer that we saw in verse 7. Look with me now at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, Jesus says, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If we abide in Christ, what's going to happen? Just like a branch that abides in the vine, we also will bear much fruit. Last last time uh, I preached on uh, John 15, the first six verses, I mentioned uh, the grapevine in my former neighbor's yard. Where Byron and I grew up, our next-door neighbor had a grapevine in the backyard. And they were wild grapes. They had the seeds in them, which I don't like 
things with seeds because you have to carefully chew so you don't bite the seed, then you have to spit the seed out, right? So it wasn't that much fun, but there were times when I would still pick a grape off that vine, and you know, it was still sweet. It was still good. And when you look at that grape vine, what did you see? You saw this larger vine, thicker vine, and coming from that vine were all sorts of little vines. And on all those little vines, you had a bunch of leaves. And on and behind those leaves and in front of those leaves and everywhere, you had these clusters of tasty-looking grapes. That was a healthy vine. Each little branch was producing fruit. And that is the image that God, Jesus here, is saying he wants to be true of each of us. He is the vine, we are the branches, we are producing fruit. So if we are abiding in Christ, if we are abiding in the vine, if we are getting our life from him day after day, if we're in the word, we're in prayer, we're enjoying our fellowship with God, we're bearing fruit. You say, what fruit? What are you talking about? Are you talking about souls saved? What kind of fruit are you talking about? Are you talking about you know, uh, evangelistic success? That can be part of it. Absolutely, because as we obey Christ and follow his will, that can be fruit. But honestly, I think it's better to think in terms of the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. Is your life producing consistent love? Is your life producing consistent joy? Is your life producing consistent peace? Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and that, that last one that always gets me, self-control. There we have, very clearly in Scripture, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of following Christ. Because if we have that fruit in our lives, guess what? We're also probably going to have fruit of making disciples, right? Fruit of, of witnessing, fruit of seeing people saved as well. So, to be clear, I think that is the type of fruit that, that's in the forefront of Jesus' mind, and that makes him so happy. Uh, fruit showing that his people are following him day to day. So it's not enough to have made a decision to follow Christ 10 years ago or 30 years ago. That's not enough. Because as we look at this passage, it is a day-to-day -day walk. It is a choice that we make in the Spirit to follow Christ. That is what he is mainly talking about here in this passage. So in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. When we connect verse 7 to verse 8, I think we see a little more of what Jesus is talking about by answer prayer. If our prayers result in us bearing fruit, then there's probably a very good chance that Christ will answer that prayer. Because it's all linked. The Father is glorified by us bearing fruit. The Father is glorified by answering our prayer. And so it makes sense that if we are growing in Christ, then, and, then we will be asking for things that result in us being even more fruitful. And as he says, so prove, prove to be my disciples. Again, we're looking at two things here. We're looking at, number one, did you at some point in time make a decision to follow Christ and be his disciple? You did? That's great. All right, if you look back at the beginning of chapter 15, you're in the vine. But, God calls us to prove it, day after day, to prove that we are his disciples. And that is where we live out day to day, that decision that we once made by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we live out day to day by the power of the Holy Spirit, that bearing of fruit and abiding in him. Jesus wants us to do amazing things through him. And I can't think of anything more amazing than asking God for things and seeing him do them and having that, that, that satisfaction and joy of being used by God, being part of his plan, see, enjoying that relationship with God, having that joyful, satisfied life day after day because of, I get to experience seeing him work. That's amazing. And he wants us, Jesus wants us to do amazing things through him. So if you're genuine, genuinely a believer listening to this message today, as I assume we likely are here uh, in this room. 
then you are abiding securely in Christ, and Christ is abiding in you. What comfort. But according to this passage, it's, again, it's not enough to know you are God's child because of a decision you made. Christ calls us to abide in him continually, to make him the priority in our life, to delight in him, to bring him to our mind regularly, and to make his priorities our priorities. We all want to experience what we just looked at in this passage, right? We want to have that experience of answer prayer, amazing answers to prayer, and bearing spiritual fruit for God. But do we want this more than we want oftentimes what the world has to offer? Are we maybe more consumed at times with the pleasures of this world? Are we more consumed with the opportunities of this world? And again, might not necessarily be sinful things. Like having a job is not a sinful thing, but if, if you put more value on your job than you put on your relationship with Christ, then guess what? You have become double-minded in that sense. And you are not abiding in Christ to the degree that he calls us to. Do we let other things dominate our thoughts and become our priorities? And I think that if we're honest, many listening, including myself, who is preaching, would have to say that we struggle with this. But as James says, cleanse your hearts, you sinners. Cleanse your hands, excuse me, purify your hearts. Mourn, weep, humble yourselves before God, and only then will he exalt us to the status of a super fruit bearer who sees God answer our prayers. Jesus wants us to do amazing things through him. According to his will, that's what he wants, us, wants of us. So we saw that, but as the passage continues, we see more of the good life that God offers us. We, we see next that Jesus wants us to experience his love constantly. To experience his love constantly. Well, look with me now, if you would, at verses 9 through 10. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus wants us to experience his love constantly. First of all, we see that Jesus compares his love for us to his Father's love for him. How much do you think the Father loves the Son? On a scale of 1 to 10, we'd have to say infinity, right? We can't put it on a scale. Because the Father loves the Son to a degree that we cannot comprehend. How much does Christ love us? The same way. He loves us not one degree less, I believe, than the Father loves his Son. So we can't comprehend the Son's love for us, just like we can't comprehend the Father's love for the Son. This is a type of love that is so deep, that is so strong, that we can't fully understand it, but we can experience it. How amazing is that, that we can experience love that has no end, that, that has no way to fathom it? Jesus says that since he loves us with love so amazing, we must abide in his love. Why wouldn't we want to? Why would we not want to abide in that love? I mean, when we understand that his love is so incomprehensible, wouldn't we want to abide in that? We must abide in that. We must continually live as one of God's children, someone that Jesus always loves. He says, abide in it. Abide in my love. Follow him. One way that we, to express the idea of, of following Christ that we've seen many other ways throughout Scripture. But this raises a question, doesn't it? And that question, I believe, at least one question it raises is this. Doesn't God already love us if we have made the decision to follow him? Doesn't God already love us? Why do we need to worry about him, you know, you know the, this ongoing lifestyle uh, of love? You know, doesn't God already love us? Well, yes, he does. Uh, if we were genuine in our acceptance of salvation, absolutely God loves us as one of his children. But the only way we will know 
that we were genuine 10 years ago, 30 years ago, is if we continue in our relationship with Christ. As he said before, and so prove to be my disciples. How do we prove it? We prove it by the ongoing discipleship, on, by, by unceasingly following Christ. If we continue in our relationship with Christ, Jesus puts it this way because he wants to get the attention of those who say one thing, who say, oh yes, God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, but they're not actually obeying God. We see this all the time, don't we? If you've ever talked with people about uh, their, their spirituality, it's very common for people to say, oh yeah, of course I love God. Oh yeah, absolutely I believe in Jesus. But does their life evidence their profession? That is who Jesus is talking about here. He's saying it is not enough to say one thing. You must live what your profession. Day to day. So how do we really know if we're abiding in the love of Christ? Jesus answers this question again in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, there you have it. If you, commit, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So, Jesus here is saying, I abide in the Father's love. Jesus himself is saying, I abide in the Father's love because I keep my Father's commandments. Jesus can't say, oh yeah, I believed in the Father once, so I'm safe forever, even though how I live now doesn't matter. Jesus can't say that. How, how can we say that then? You know, we can't, you know, no one can say, if Jesus, has to, if Jesus has to obey his Father, it only stands to reason that we also must obey Christ if we can, if we can say that we're truly his children. So we too must continue in that relationship of obedience and that is what Jesus is really trying to say. And he's saying this over and over and over and over and over again. It's not enough to make a profession. You have to walk. You have to abide. You have to stay vitally connected to the vine, Jesus Christ, day after day. So we know that we are abiding in the love of Christ if we are keeping his commandments. And this is true for us. This is true for Christ. Also in relationship to his Father's love, Jesus wants us to experience his love constantly. And how do we do that? By constantly abiding. So when we see what Jesus is saying here, we might be tempted to wonder something. Let me raise another question. A question that you might be thinking of right now. Is it possible for me to lose my salvation? This is a question I brought up when we looked at the previous few verses a few weeks ago. Is Jesus saying that you can lose your salvation? I believe it's clear in other passages of Scripture, even in the book of John and other places, that no, we cannot lose our salvation. But what again is Christ saying here? He's saying that someone who is truly saved is going to live out their salvation. Someone who makes a profession of faith but then lives their life as if they had never done that, that profession was probably not genuine to begin with. A true believer is safe in Christ. But a true believer proves that they are safe in Christ by continually living out their faith. So there is no conflict between these two teachings, although you might wonder if there is. There is no conflict, and it makes sense. Christ is holding us to the same standard. He has to obey his Father to be, continually stay uh, in his Father's good graces. And we are called to do the same. Now, does that mean that when we sin, if we fall into something that, uh-oh, maybe I was never saved to begin with? How do you answer that question? What if you, if you sin, and now you're not abiding in Christ that day? Does that mean that you weren't even saved to begin with? I think a good way to get assurance of our salvation in those times of failure is to see what happens next. What happens after you fail? What happens after you sin? Are you fine with just continuing in your sin? If you're fine, then yeah, you probably should have some doubts about whether you're 
you were actually saved to begin with. But God in his love, he loves us so much that he cannot, he cannot tolerate his children's suffering in their sin, wallowing in that mire of sin. Because what, is, what does he do? When we fall into sin, we then feel the pain, don't we? Just like King David. When he fell into sin, he was miserable. I mean, he was physically sick because of his sin. And God in his love did that to David. So God in his love does that to us as children as well. If you, if you, when you drop the ball, you are struggling, I think that's a pretty good evidence. You know what? I probably was saved to begin with because God is not going to let me go. He is not going to let me off easy. He is not going to let me just coast in my, in my lusts and in my sinfulness. No, he is going to bring it to my mind time after time after time. He is going to keep reeling me back in because he loves me that much. He loves me just like the father loves the son. And he's not going to let us be comfortable in living out the, the sins of the world, the lust of the flesh, what leads to death. So that gives me great comfort. That should give us all great comfort. That when we sin, if we're truly his children, we're going to feel it. And we're going to recognize, wow, yep, I messed up. I need to repent. I need to cleanse my hands. I need to change my heart by the power of God. I need to humble myself before God, submit myself before him, and then I will see his exaltation. I will see his restoration. So that, I believe, is great, a great comfort. So yes, this is teaching that we must not ignore and teaching that is life-changing. Many of us know what it's like to have goals. How many of you here say, I have goals in my life? All right, good. We know what it's like to have goals. Some of these goals might be goals that someone else gives you, actually. Maybe you have goals at your job. The job that you work, guess what? Your boss gave you goals. Maybe your parents have given you goals. Maybe a friend that's keeping you accountable uh, spiritually, or you know, maybe you have a, an exercise buddy that keeps you accountable uh, with your exercising. For, for, for true believers, Jesus gives us goals. Why are goals helpful? As much as I don't like goals many times because they make me uncomfortable and make me feel like, oh man, uh, I've got to keep pushing, keep pushing. Um, Goals are helpful because they actually give us a target to shoot at. They actually give us something to strive for. They actually show us, they actually give us an indication of whether we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing or whether we're just wasting our time. So at my job, when annual review time comes around, That's the time when my boss thinks about my job and thinks, all right, what do I want Wade to accomplish this year? And then he gives me a list of goals. And then he sends that list of goals to me. And I have to read through that list of goals. And I might say, oh, man, that's a tough one. Oh, that's going to be hard. I don't know if I like this goal. But in the end, what do I have to do? I have to look at that little button at the end of, do you accept these goals? And I have to take my, my mouse and I have to click that button that I accept the goals. Maybe it's different for you, but that's the way it works at my job. I have to click the button that I accept the goals that my boss has given me. Here in this passage, Christ is doing something similar. He's giving us a, bu- he's giving us a list of goals and he's giving us a button to click. And he's saying, accept these goals that I've given you if you want to have the good life. Jesus wants us to experience his love constantly. And when we, when we look at this passage here, the last verse of this passage, verse 11, we see one final thing. Jesus wants us to choose fullness of joy. Look with me at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. God, Jesus wants us to choose fullness of joy. That's definitely part of the good life, isn't it? Is there anyone here that says, no, I don't really want to have fullness of joy. I don't really want to be as joyful as humanly possible. I kind of like being miserable. Is there anyone here like that? All right, I didn't think so. We all want to be joyful. Here Jesus tells his disciples why he is telling them all these things. 
He wants his joy to abide within his disciples. He wants them to know the joy of Christ. As he says in verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Now, Jesus is perfect. Don't you think he also had perfect joy? Wouldn't you like to experience, have that that taste of the joy that Christ has in his heart? That's what he's saying. He's saying that my joy may be in you and that your joy then may be full. He wants us to have the fullness of joy. He wants to be the most joyful people that have ever lived. He wants us to have an overpowering and overflowing sense of joy day after day. And despite whatever difficult things may happen, he wants that joy to be stronger than the circumstances of life. Let's say if you've ever lost your job, that's a pretty low place, isn't it? If you've ever gotten really sick, if you've had life just blindside you, in some way that never happened before. Is it possible to still be joyful even through those very difficult circumstances? According to this passage, I believe so. He wants our joy to be stronger than those life circumstances because even though life changes, things in life change and they are difficult, God never changes. Our salvation never changes. And if we think about life in those terms of what really matters, our relationship with Christ, then guess what? Yeah, I lost my job. But you know what? Christ is still on the throne. He still loves me. He wants me to have fullness of joy. I think he's going to take care of me. Fullness of joy that is more powerful than any bad thing that can happen in our lives. So just like a body in Christ's love, uh, though, we have a part to play, don't we? We must allow Christ's joy to be part of our thinking. Christ isn't just going to run up to us with a syringe of joy and while we're looking the other way, stick it in our arms. Oh, wow, how did that? Thank you, Christ. I didn't even have to do anything there at all. I didn't have to obey you. I didn't have to pray. I didn't have to read my Bible. You just gave me joy. This is a great deal. That's not exactly, that's not at all how it works. We have a part to play. We must allow Christ's joy to be part of our thinking. And we must allow it to, to Christ's joy then to create joy in our own lives because of that close relationship that we have with Christ. Jesus wants us to choose fullness of joy. When we think about people in the world that we might know, associate with day after day, many people think they know what joy is, don't they? They think they know how to get it. And sometimes we as believers imitate the lost world in thinking that we understand what true joy is outside of what God says. But I will tell you, it's only until we make abiding in Christ our focus and mission that we will truly understand joy. And if, if you haven't done that, if you, like me, look at your life and say, you know what, I, I have failed in this, then the good news is, think of all the joy you have coming your way when you turn this around by the power of God. That you will, just think of of, of when you will truly experience the fullness of joy when you're able to let those things go that are distracting you from the body in Christ as he's called you to. So who here, listening to this message, is willing to take God at his word and trust him that if we follow his way, that we will experience joy like we never have before. Do you believe God when he says that? Do you truly believe him enough to change what you're doing if what you're doing now is conflicting with God's will for your life? Who is willing to cast aside here today those distractions of the world that are weighing us down so that we uh, are having a hard time turning to Christ? We often think of following Jesus as hard work and sacrifice, right? And isn't it sometimes? Isn't it difficult sometimes to follow Christ? Absolutely. Yes, it can involve that. But looking at the passage today, we see that it is not a thankless obedience. It is not an obedience that just leads to misery. Obeying Christ leads to joy that we will not find anywhere else. Jesus wants us to choose fullness of joy. And this leads us to what I would say is the main idea of the passage, 
If we want to experience true life, the good life, we must constantly seek life in Christ. Constantly seek life, not in the world, not in our friends, not in our job, not in these other things. Seek life in Christ, in that relationship with him. Now, we started out looking at this passage today. We started out talking about, as I've already said many times, the good life. Maybe you had a picture in your mind of what the good life looks like. And while many people legitimately enjoy life in ways that, you know, commonly come to our mind, like, you know, the American dream of, of uh, relaxation and fun and, and this and that, um, I guarantee you the people that think they have it good who do not know Christ, they have no idea what, what the good life looks like. They have no idea what true joy looks like. They might appear to be satisfied. They might appear to be doing okay. Whenever you see them, that yeah, there's a smile on their face most of the time. But guess what? They have no idea. Because what they are doing is not what God says they should be doing, which means they are not experiencing the life that they could be experiencing if they followed Christ. Will you today go before the Lord, and will you seek him for the strength that you need, for the direction you need, for how you can abide in Christ more than you ever have done before. If we want to experience true life, we must constantly seek life in Christ.